What's going on, hybrid shooters? It's Jason Vaughn. Got a lot of requests asking me to do a setup guide on the Sony A7 III, specifically how I set this up for hybrid shooting, how I set this up for both photos and videos. You guys are more than welcome to use what I have set up as a base template because I'm pretty sure you guys are going to modify it to fit your needs. And just because I go over the settings that I use, I'll also try my best to go over certain features that you need to be aware of when you're setting up your Sony a7 III. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. All right, so first I'm gonna go over how I mapped out my physical buttons right here. So if you could just join me on tab two, page eight, we're gonna start messing around with the custom keys and the function menu set. Now you're gonna notice that there's custom keys available for video, for photos, and for playback. We're only going to be messing with the photo one. Um, everything else, the video and the playback, pretty much just follows whatever I have customized on the photo, um, the photo section. So control wheel, I have nothing set. Custom button one, I have it set to finder and monitor selection toggle. So I personally set the finder and monitor setting on manual because I don't like the proximity sensor. You know, this is supposed to help you switch between the finder and the monitor when you have the camera close to your eye. But sometimes when I'm flying uh, a gimbal like the Zuyin Crane, the motor would be really close to the eyepiece, so it would trigger that toggle, which I don't like. I like having that control myself. So that is why I set one of my custom buttons to have a toggle between the finder and the monitor. And this is also helpful too when I want to switch between the monitor and the, and the viewfinder when I'm shooting in broad daylight. When it's super bright outside where I can't really see the monitor to gauge my exposure, my color, or my white balance, I can just toggle it to the viewfinder, look through it, and just start shooting from there. Next up, custom button number two, I have it set to the autofocus manual focus control toggle. Now, a lot of my Sony lenses don't have the actual autofocus and manual focus toggle on the lens itself, like this Zeiss bodice lens right here, or my Zeiss 55. So when I need to quickly switch to manual focus to nail focus on a certain object or subject that I'm shooting, I can just press the C2 and just quickly get focus from there. All right, custom button number three, I have it set to APS-C Super 35 slash full frame selection toggle. So if you guys didn't know, the Sony Alpha full frame mirrorless cameras can shoot in both full frame and in crop frame, so you can use crop lenses as well. But how I use it is to squeeze out that extra bit of distance that I would get from a lens. So if I switch to super 35 mode, I get this 1.5 times crop. Now, obviously that would only work if you're shooting with a full frame lens. So I like setting it to the custom button three here where it's away from everything else. So it ensures that my right hand right here will accidentally trigger the camera to go into super 35 mode. So having it away from everything else definitely helps. That way I'm conscious when I'm switching to super 35 mode or switching back to full frame mode. Now just to reiterate, Super 35 mode allows you to use APS-C lenses. So if you mount an APS-C lens onto a full frame camera, it will crop out the vignetting and effectively using it like a crop camera. But again, how I like to use it is to maximize the range that I would get out of a lens. Let's say I have this 18 millimeter right here. This is a full frame lens. On a full frame, it will be 18 millimeters. If I switch to super 35 mode, it will be 27 millimeters, giving me that extra distance that I would get with this lens. Another example would be if I'm shooting with an 85, I feel like I still need an extra bit of distance with my 85. I switch to super 35 mode and now I'm getting something like 130 millimeters with that lens. Super extremely helpful feature just in case you guys didn't know. That's a quick tip for you guys in this video. Moving on, custom button number four, which is zoom. So I have set the zoom function, which I'll show you guys in a bit, to clear image zoom. Again, how we were talking about squeezing out extra bit of distance out of your lens, well, clear image zoom allows you to do that as well. Uh, you can actually zoom in up to two times, digitally zoom in up to two times without losing too much quality. Now this is 
way better, way more effective if you are shooting in 4K as opposed to 1080p. When you are using clear image zoom on 4K, you're not gonna lose that much quality. The, the quality the quality difference will be very minimal. But if you clear image zoom at 1080p, I wouldn't push it past 1.4 times. Otherwise, it will look a little pixelated. Moving on to page two, Moti Selection Center button. Uh, <laughs> I wish they would just call it a joystick because that's essentially what it is. If you like press down on the joystick, it will activate whatever features that you have set uh, or programmed to it. So I have here just focus standard. You can change it to whatever else. I don't usually press that button anyway, so I kind of just left it there by default. Uh, center button is center lock on autofocus. Again, something that I don't really often use. I just kind of leave it there as a default. But what that does is um, you can actually use it as like an object tracking. Let's say you uh, have your subject right in the center. You know that subject is going to move. You can use center lock on autofocus so the camera will automatically lock on focus to that subject. So if that subject is uh, walking to and from the camera or left and right, the camera will lock on focus on that subject. Next up is the left button, which I have it set to focus area. And this just allows me to squeak, uh, quickly switch between the focus area wide, zone, uh, spot, or center. Uh, right button is the ISO, which allows me to change the ISO, obviously. Next up is down button, which I think I'm actually going to change into something else in the near future because um, I had this set to uh, set up with my Sony a7R2 and my Sony a6500, and that just pretty much allows me to quickly move my focus point around with the control wheel. But since they include the joystick now, the Sony a7R3 and the Sony a7 III, I really don't need that focus setting on my down button because I can just use my joystick to move the focus around. So that will be changed in the near future. Page three, AEL button, uh, I have as focus magnifier. This just pretty much helps me um, grab focus manually when I'm shooting photos. That's gonna be a little different in my custom video keys. Uh, AF on button, I have it set to eye autofocus. Um, some people like to do back button focusing. So if you like to do back button focusing, you can actually switch the AF on button to focus standard and program AEL button to your AEL button to I autofocus. So that's one way that you can do it yourself, but I don't do back button focusing. So I just kind of keep the uh, AF on button as the IAF button. The focus hold button is also set to uh, IAF. Now certain Sony lenses has a button on the lens itself, and you can actually change that to have a different function or different settings. For me, I just have it as the default, which is the eye autofocus. Okay, so moving on to the movie custom key. Again, everything just sort of follows whatever I have set for the custom, uh, for the photo custom keys. The only thing that I have different is um, the AEL button would be my gamma display assist. Let's say I'm shooting an S-log or hybrid log gamma. I can quickly pull up the gamma display assist to monitor my white balance and of course my exposure settings. My AF on button would be the focus magnifier. So in case I switch to manual focus on my camera, I can just press the AF on button to quickly zoom into that subject that I'm trying to focus on and just twist the ring until I get focus on it. Next up is the playback custom key. Uh, everything is pretty much in its default setting except custom button number three, which is ratings. Uh, by default, it should be protect, but I like to have it as rating because you can actually star the photos that you've taken. So I changed it to ratings. And when you pull up the ratings, um, um, I guess, menu, you have an option of having it rate from one to five stars. Now, I personally have it up to two stars the way that uh, the way that I have my workflow is when I'm reviewing the photos, one star for me is a maybe two star means definitely it's a definite use that I will use this photo. Now, again, everybody has a different workflow. You're more than welcome to uh, use all five stars if you wanted to. But two stars is good enough to let me know which is which the which is the photos that I will need to import or use for social media or for whatever project it is that I'm working working on. So um, that is the rating set key for the playback. Whoo, felt like I talked for eternity. I think it's already been 20 minutes and I'm still not done with this one section right here. 
Honestly, I think this is the toughest part though. Moving on, uh, function menu set. And this is pretty much where um, you can pull up all of your quick function settings on your camera, which is this FN key right here. So um, whew, let's see here. Okay, so function upper, I have drive mode. Uh, number two, I have white balance. Three is focus mode. Four is focus area. Five is audio record level. Six is picture profile. Um, moving on to the lower level. Lower one, I have S and Q frame rate. Two, zebra display. Three, zebra level. Four, face priority in autofocus. Five, grid line. And six, marker display. So I think it'll be easier for me to start describing things if I actually pulled up the actual... <laughs> Uh, function menu. <clears throat> okay, so the first one is drive mode. This allows me to switch between high speed continuous or just single shot. Um, next one is auto white balance. That just allows me to switch to white balance on the fly. The third one is uh, focus mode. This allows me to switch between single shot autofocus, autofocus continuous, and of course manual focus. I just by default leave it as autofocus continuous unless I'm shooting photos and need it to be a single shot autofocus. Focus area, um, really don't need to be touching it in the function menu because I already have it as my left key, but it's also a good indicator to let me know what focus mode I'm in. Next up is the audio record level. This allows me to control how loud I want the, um, or sorry, the, the gain of my audio. So if I don't use any sort of um, shotgun mic or external mic, I will set this as 15, but if I'm using a lav mic, I will set this to one. Oh, by the way, if certain functions on your screen is grayed out, it's just because you're not in the right mode on the dial right here. So uh, if it's grayed out for whatever reason, it's just, that's probably, that's probably it. Picture profile. Uh, a lot of people have been asking me what picture profiles do I use. Um, for the most part right now, I'm shooting picture profile one, which is the default movie profile. It works for me. Um, the other picture profile that I like to use is EOS HD Pro 3.0. EOS HD Pro Color is pretty much this little guide that um, Andrew Reed from EOSHD.com uh, put together to allow you to get very similar Canon colors, Canon tones on your camera. And actually what you're watching right now is shot on that profile with the Sony a7R 3 uh, Moving on is the S and Q frame rate. Uh, I have it on 60, but having it on the quick function key allows me to switch between 120 and 60 frames per second when I need to twist to the S and Q mode on the dial right here to shoot in slow motion. And I'll probably address something about the S and Q function when I get into the menu itself. Woo, I am getting winded already. <laughs> Moving on is of course the zebra display. Uh, I like to toggle it on and off right there. And right next to us is the zebra level. I pretty much just keep it at 107 plus by default. So I'll expose for my highlights until I start seeing zebras. And when I do, I would just uh, stop down until I don't see it. So I know my highlights aren't blown out. At 107 plus, I know that there's still some highlights I can recover in post-production. So that's a, that's a little nice indicator for myself. Right next to it is face priority AF. And generally I keep it on if I know I'm shooting a, a, a human subject, but if I'm shooting stuff like an establishing shot and there's a lot of people walking by my shot, I don't want the camera to pull focus on a, a, a random stranger. So if that's the case, I would just turn off face detection uh, autofocus within the function menu itself. So the next one is grid lines and pretty much I have this enabled whenever I need to properly frame up my whatever it is that I'm shooting in the rule of thirds or if I need some guidelines to help me when I'm flying the camera on the gimbal just to make sure my horizon stays level or whatever it is I'm shooting or orbiting around stays in the center. Right next to it is marker display. So whenever I shoot weddings with my partner, we shoot in the two, three, five by one ratio. So I just like to have it on the function menu to quickly switch to the two, three, five uh, by one aspect ratio on the function menu. Now, one of the things that I haven't mentioned in this video is the fact that you can actually recall some of your favorite settings via the one and two icon on your dial. 
it's called memory recall. So you have two slots right here that you can put some of your favorite settings. So let's say, for example, you can program all of your uh, 4K 24 frame settings into one. And then on your two, you can have your 120p 1080p slow motion. This essentially just helps you switch time from having to dig through your menu to get to the 120 frames per second and having to dial in your shutter speed. This is just a quick flip of a switch and you will be in super slow motion already. So that's just one example on how to use memory recall. Obviously, you can uh, program to however you want it. And it's actually very easy to set up. Just be in the mode that you want to be, whether it be in photo mode or video mode, have all of your shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and white balance dial in, and then just go to the menu, go to memory recall, and just register it into either one or two. And that's pretty much it for the function menu. All right, now let's actually move on to the actual menu settings. Whew. Boy, I hope this is not too boring for you guys. Uh, let me know if you've made it this far already and still are enjoying this content right here. Okay, so pressing the menu button takes us to the first page. Um, tab one, file format, raw plus JPEG. I always shoot raw and JPEG. For the most part, I just use the JPEG for any sort of Instagram, social media post. But if I really like a photo a lot, I'll take the raw file to my Lightroom and process the image. Or if I'm shooting wedding photos, of course, just it's just good to be able to have both the raw and the JPEG files. File type compress. There's a lot of debate about this, whether we should shoot compressed or uncompressed. I think Tony Northrup addressed this in like a video two years ago saying he didn't see that much of a difference between compressed and uncompressed. So I just keep it as compressed. JPEG quality, I keep it at, uh, keep it at extra fine. Again, I shoot the JPEG from my camera to my phone for social media content and I want to have the highest quality JPEG possible. Right under it is the JPEG image size. You have the, the, the choice between 24, 10, or 6. 24 is fine. It sends the photo really quickly to my phone so there's no issues with the size itself. With the uh, A7R 3 though, 42 megapixels is too much to transfer to a phone. So that I would set to 18 megapixels. Here I would leave it at 24. 24 is just fine. Aspect ratio, three by two. Um, that's for photos. Of course you want it by three by two. Now the next one right here is APS-C and Super 35. Uh, I changed it to manual and off because I personally like to have full control of my Super 35 toggle. And again, that's something that I programmed to my C3 so I can just quickly switch from full frame to Super 35 mode. I don't want the camera to automatically determine that for me. So I keep it off and manual. Next page is long exposure, noise reduction, and high ISO noise reduction. I believe these only affect your JPEGs. Uh, it doesn't affect your RAW files. So if you would like some a little bit of noise reduction in your JPEG uh, photos for long exposure and high ISO, go ahead and keep that on normal or on or high, whatever it is you like. That is totally your preference. Color space, sRGB, that's what I leave it on. Uh, page three of tab one, nothing here. Four, ignore that. Five, okay, tab five. Okay, this is an important one. Switch vertical and horizontal autofocus area point. So I have it on autofocus point plus autofocus area. And what this means is that, let's say you are shooting Let's say you're, you have to shoot in both portrait and landscape orientation a lot. So you can have uh, your landscape orientation, the focus point to be on the center. And when you switch to portrait orientation, you can have it as focus area uh, zone on the top, top center. Um, and when you go back to landscape, it'll go back to uh, center focusing. And this is helpful for when I shoot uh, concert photography um, whenever I shoot in the landscape orientation, I know I always want to frame my musicians to the right third of the frame. And when I want to shoot portraits of them, uh, I have it on my top zone, zone, center, <laughs> zone, center at the top. So every time I bounce between uh, landscape and portrait orientation, it would just remember those autofocus settings that I have uh, uh, set too. So it's extremely helpful. I encourage you guys to try it out, especially if you bounce between portrait orientation and landscape orientation a lot when you're shooting um, photos. 
Okay, moving on, autofocus illuminator, I turned that off. If you have it on when you're in a dark area, uh, this, this little orange light will beam out to help you grab focus on a subject. That's generally kind of annoying for me if I'm shooting in a low light situation, so I just turn it off. Center lock on autofocus, uh, we already talked about that. Next one is set face priority in autofocus. Now this is important to know. So earlier I talked about how I turn on and off for face detection autofocus. This one right here allows you to control that, but also displays the little box around people's faces. So you'll see right here in the second option right here, face detect frame display. I keep it on just so I know it is grabbing focus on a face and which face it's grabbing focus on. Next one is autofocus track sensitivity. I generally just keep it at three. If you have a moving subject that's moving quite quickly, you might want to change that to five. If they're moving like a turtle, you might just want to set it to uh, one. But uh, <laughs> if you're noticed your camera is focus hunting a lot, it may be because of these settings right here. Um, for me, I had it at five before, so when I was trying to shoot portraits, it was just focus hunting like crazy. But when I set it back to three, it was working perfectly fine. So uh, something to check when you are having a little bit of a focus issue with the camera. Autofocus with shutter, I keep it on. Again, we talked about back button focusing earlier. So if you're a type of person who likes to use back button focusing with the AF on button, this is something that you want to turn off. Autofocus with shutter, turn that off. I keep it on because I like to have hold my shutter to pre-focus on a subject before snapping the shot. That's just me. All right, moving on. Pre-AF I have off. Everything is pretty much in its default setting right there. Okay, so now I'm on page nine of tab one. We're still on tab one right here. Uh, metering mode, I have it as multi. That pretty much just looks at your entire screen to determine the best exposure when you are using auto ISO. Face priority in multimeter, I have that as off. Spot metering point, you can either, either have it on center or wherever you have the focus point on your screen to be. I just generally keep it in the middle. Next up is flash. If you are shooting anything with flash, especially wireless flash, you wanna make sure that wireless flash is turned on. Otherwise, whatever receiver that you have, or sorry, transmitter that you have here on the camera, it would not fire the flashes. So make sure you have the wireless flash on. Next up is white balance. And for me, I like to have my priority set in auto white balance as ambience. That is just my personal preference. By default, it would just come as standard. You can have the option as white as well, but for me, I just have it as ambience. That's just a personal preference. Uh, picture profile we talked about uh, page 13 now of tab one focus magnify time I put no limit because I want to take my time to make sure that I know my subject is in focus so if I need to manual focus I would like my focus magnify time to have no limit uh, peaking setting I don't often use peaking on my camera just because the camera display is quite small as it is already. If I have any other little dots on the screen, it's actually harder for me to tell if my subject is in focus. So I kind of just rely on my eye and the, uh, and the sharpness of the image. But if you are the type of person who likes to use peaking when you're manually focused some on something, then this is the settings that you want to mess with. Anti-flicker shoot, I have it off. Face registration, uh, this just pretty much, if you're shooting weddings, if you're shooting uh, any important figure that you know is gonna be the main subject throughout your entire photo shoot, you want to register their face on your camera. That way, when um, this person, or either the bride or the groom, or whoever the important figure is, if they're in a group, the camera will always prioritize the focus on their face instead of the random faces that are also on the screen. So that's a helpful way of using uh, face registration. All right, finally, we're moving on to tab two. Whew. Uh, I think everything just pretty much is downhill from here. So uh, tab two, page one, exposure mode. Now this affects your videos only. So you'll notice the little film strip right next to it. That just means it affects the, uh, the uh, video mode. So exposure mode, I have it as manual exposure. I like to control all of my settings whenever I'm shooting videos. ISO, shutter speed, aperture, all that. That's why it's in manual exposure. You'll see S and Q exposure mode here grayed out. Again, if it's grayed out for whatever reason, it's just because you're not in the right mode. So you switch to S and Q on the top. 
you can actually change the exposure mode for S and Q. And again, I just keep it as manual exposure. All right, so moving on file format, I generally shoot in 4K 24 frames per second. You also have an option of shooting 4K 30 frames, but with the A7 III, just keep in mind, you're gonna have that hefty cropped when you are shooting in 4K 30. Uh, I think it was 1.5 times, but someone else told me it was 1.2 times. Someone fact check me on that, but just keep in mind that there's gonna be a crop when you're shooting 4K 30. But if you're shooting 4K 24, nothing to worry about. Uh, or you have an option to shoot in XAVC SHD, which is just 1080p. You have an option between 60 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second, and 120 frames per second. Oh, yes, and one more thing. Don't ever shoot in AVCHD. It's a horrible Kotec. Just take my word for it. It's bad. Stick with the XAVC codex for 4K and 1080p. So, S and Q settings. What is S and Q? S and Q stands for slow and quick. This allows you to shoot hyperlapses or slow motion. Now, here's a debacle that I've been in lately. I've been shooting a lot of my slow motion in S and Q, but from what people are telling me, um, when you're shooting slow motion in S and Q, the bit rate on those videos aren't as high as if you're shooting, let's say, um, 60 frames per second, 60p or 120p in uh, in the regular movie mode. So I think they're saying that if you're shooting 120 frames per second or 60 frames per second in HD, it's better to do it in the 1080p mode instead of S and Q mode. Now, when you're shooting slow motion in S and Q, it does not record sound at all, but it'll play back the footage in real time, in slow motion real time, sorry. It'll play back the footage in slow motion. But if you are shooting 60p or 120p in regular 1080p settings, it'll play back in real time and you have an option to slow it down in post. And if you do it that way, it'll also record sound as well versus S and Q, it will not record sound. Boy, I hope whatever I said makes sense. But if you are someone who doesn't really care about that kind of stuff and you want to use S and Q to do your slow motion, then uh, the settings that I personally like to use is record setting 24, 24p and the frame rate I like to bounce between 60 frames per second and 120 frames per second. Whew, oh boy, I think I'm running out of water here. All right, um, on the bottom right here is proxy recording. If you have that on, um, it would just record like a 720p file, I believe, a .mov 720p file that simultaneously gets recorded to whatever whatever it is you have. So you can you have an option of shooting in 4K and a proxy file that gets created. So um, you can actually use this proxy file to send to your smartphone if you want to quickly send something to social media. And this is personally what I like to use for Instagram stories. I would have the proxy recording turned on and I would just shoot like this for Instagram stories, send the footage to my phone, use some sort of rotation app on my phone and then shoot it over to Instagram stories. So that's a great way to use proxy recording as well. And I also heard that um, you can actually use these proxy files to, to substitute your high quality 4K files when you're editing on uh, Premiere Pro or Final Cut. So it just saves you the uh, ingest time, the, the conversion time of having to create proxy files during editing. You can actually have the camera create proxy files that are ready to go, that are ready to link up in your editing software to start editing right away. That way, when you're ready to export the high quality 4K files, you just have to relink link it to your uh, actual high quality 4K files. Boy, I talked too much that my computer fell asleep. Okay, moving on to page two of tab two. Autofocus drive speed, autofocus track sensitivity, those are normal and standard. If you want to learn more about autofocus settings, uh, check out my autofocus settings guide. I know I made that last year, but a lot of the principles still applies for the newer Sony cameras, like the A7R three and of course the A7 III right here. So uh, click up here to check it out or find the link in the description box below. 
Uh, audio recording is on. Audio record level is set to 15. Again, like I said, whatever I said earlier about the record level, 15 for when I have a shotgun mic uh, and or no mic, and one for when I'm using lav mics. Audio record level display is always on. Again, if you see your audio settings grayed out, it's just because you're in the wrong mode. Just make sure you're in movie mode when you are changing these audio settings right here. Okay, page three of tab two. Wind noise reduction. Always keep that off. Never have it on because your audio will sound like crap if you have wind noise reduction turned on. So my best advice to you is leave that off. Marker display, we already talked about this. Movie with shutter is on. Turn that on. So a lot of people's gripe with the Sony A7R2 and the S2 and the 6500 is that they cannot use the movie, they, they cannot use the shutter button here to trigger movie recording, which frustrated a lot of people. They have to set their custom one button to the movie record button. So Sony is now finally allowing you to use the shutter as the movie record button as well. So you can actually press on the movie shutter button, uh, sorry, the shutter button right here to trigger movie recording. So if you are a fan of that, make sure you turn that on. Okay, moving on to page four of tab two, silent shooting. If this is great out for you, just make sure you're in photo mode. Uh, silent shooting, you wanna have that on if you want to be discreet when you're taking photos. Let's say you're on a movie set or you're on a golf tournament. Those are the examples that Sony give in their, in their presentations. But it, I personally like to use it when I am at a wedding where I'm not the official photographer, I'm just a guest, and I want to be rapidly, uh, rapid firing shots away uh, of the couple on the altar or something like that. So this allows you to just be discreet when you are shooting. So keep that on if you want to, um, if you want to be discreet with your shooting. But if you start to notice any sort of banding or, 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 or weird things happening when you're doing silent shooting, just turn it off. Um, oh, and one thing about silent shooting is if you're in silent shooting mode, you cannot use any of the picture profiles. I think you're limited to just creative styles and um, standard profiles. So just keep that in mind. Moving on is the electronic front curtain shutter. So again, if you're noticing any sort of banding issues, just make sure that this setting here is turned off. Release without lens, release without card. I have those both enabled. Okay, moving on. Steady shot, I have it on. That pretty much just enables the in-body image stabilization in your camera, which is super helpful when you are hand-holding and shooting videos. Um, it would just help stabilize your footage a little bit. Steady shot settings, let's say you are using a manual lens, um, lenses that won't able to electronically communicate with your camera to determine the best steady shot setting. So let's say you're using a, a, a cinema lens that is a 24 millimeters. So you would actually go into here and change the steady shot focal length to 24 millimeters. And if you switch out to a 50 prime lens, you would change that to 50 millimeters. But for the most part, if your lens can electronically communicate with the camera, then just leave it as auto. It would just automatically determine the best settings to stabilize the lens that you are using. Okay, moving on zoom, you need to be in movie mode for this. So I have it as clear image zoom. Again, this just allows me to squeeze out an extra bit of distance with my lenses. I have the clear image zoom button set to my C4, so I can zoom in, digitally zoom in up to two times in 4K without losing any sort of quality. So that's the setting that you wanna make sure that you have on clear image zoom if you plan on using clear image zoom when you're shooting 4K videos. All right, moving on to page six of tab two, finder and monitor. Um, the reason why it's grayed out on my screen is because I'm using an external recorder to record my menu settings. But when you unplug it, you'll see that you have three options right here, auto, viewfinder manual, and monitor manual. I like to have it as monitor manual because when I turn on my camera, it'll, uh, it will automatically uh, display the monitor. And again, we talked about this earlier, how I set my C1 to have that monitor and viewfinder toggle. Again, I just don't want that proximity sensor to accidentally get triggered when I'm flying the gimbal or when something accidentally covers it. So that's why I have it as monitor manual. Uh, zebra settings, we already talked about this. All right, moving on to page seven of tab two, continuous shoot length. So if you're shooting in high-speed continuous, 
uh, if you have this feature uh, turned on, it will just display a little bar on the side that lets you know your buffer. So um, if you max out your buffer, you just have to wait until the bar recharges before you can shoot again. It's just a nice little indicator to let you know how many shots you still have left before the camera has to stop to finish writing the photos first before it can continue shooting. Auto review, I have it off. And then we came back full circle with the custom keys. So page nine of tab two, custom operation number two, you'll see a thing called movie button. I have that as on always. So if I'm dabbling in the photo mode and something happens that I need to quickly take a video of, I can just press my movie button near my eyepiece and quickly, it would just quickly switch to movie mode. And this is very handy because sometimes I'm shooting photos of the models and then when I want to quickly switch to shooting slow motion videos of them, I can just quickly press my movie button right here and I'll be in movie mode right away. There's going to be a slight delay when you do that, when you're in photo mode and pressing the movie button, but hey, it's going to be a lot quicker than you twisting to the movie button and activating movie recording from there. Next up is audio signals and that pretty much is just this thing right here. It lets you know when the camera's recording and when the camera stops recording. A lot of people find that annoying, finds that distracting. I personally have it on so when I'm shooting videos like this, I know when the camera's recording and I know when the camera stops recording. So it's just helpful for me. I keep it on. Oh my god, I ran out of water. Oh, she. Okay. Let's continue. <laughs> I think we're almost. I think we're almost done here. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're out of the two craziest tabs. Okay. So the next tab we're on is tab number three, which is this global orb-looking thing. Okay. So send to smartphone function. Anything here that's important? Okay. Not really. But let me just quickly show you guys. Okay. So in order for you to transfer photos from photos or videos from your camera to your phone, you just go to your playback, you press the FN button, and it'll ask you this image or all the images from the state or multiple images. So this allows you to either select one image or one video or multiple images or multiple videos and send it to your smartphone. So you just have to make sure that your smartphone has the Play Memories app and you just have to connect it uh, via Wi-Fi and it'll wirelessly transmit the photos or videos from the camera to your phone. So that's how you would send photos and videos to your phone. Now you can't send raw, actually maybe you can send raw files. I think, okay, well, I'm gonna have a correction here on the screen if you can or cannot send the raw files, but uh, for sure you can send JPEGs from the camera to your phone and you can only send proxy recorded videos to, from your camera to your phone. So you cannot actually transfer 4K, high quality 4K videos from the camera to the phone. It needs to be proxy enabled recording videos that can be sent from the camera to the smartphone. Okie dokes. Okay, let's see here. Page two of the global tab. Okay, nothing here. Okay, playback. Those are all pretty self-explanatory. I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> That's how tired I am. <laughs> These setup guide videos were so long. Uh, and guess what? I probably have to do another one for the A7S III. Anyways, um, we are, oh, okay, yeah, we are on uh, tab four now, page three. Uh, select playback media that just pretty much controls um, when you go to your playback, would it either uh, grab the, uh, the, the data from slot one of your memory card or slot two? All right, so we are on tab five, page one, monitor brightness, and you can actually set that to either manual or sunny weather. And one of the biggest improvements on the Sony A7R3 and the A7 III and the A9 is that when you shoot in 4K, the screen will not dim. If anything, you can actually make the screen a lot brighter when you're shooting in 4K in broad daylight. So if you're having trouble seeing your screen in broad daylight, uh, you want to change that to sunny weather. Now, when you are shooting in sunny weather, though, um, it does... Um, oversaturate the 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 display a little bit and it, it makes it a little bit more contrasty as well so i wouldn't use it to gauge your exposure 
or your colors, just use it to help you frame your shot. Um, for exposure and color, just make sure, um, just trust in your settings, just trust in your meters, make sure you have zebras turned on and make sure you know your white balance is uh, set correctly. So that would be my suggestion when you are using sunny weather outdoor, or sorry, when you're using sunny weather when you're shooting videos. Okay, so this next thing right here is super duper important, which is the auto power off temperature. Make sure you set that on high. What it is, it's pretty much a heat tolerance level. So if you have it on standard, when your camera detects itself being a little warm to the point where it's going to get really hot, that it needs to shut itself down to cool itself off. Um, that's what it is. However, that could be very annoying when you're shooting any sort of long form recording, like a long ceremony or, 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 or a talk show or a live show or something like that. So you definitely want to set that on high when you're shooting those types of videos. Now it'll give you a little warning when you set it to high saying the temperature of the device may rise to prioritize, uh, to prioritize recording time. Would you like to change the settings? And the answer is yes. Okay, next up, NTSC pound, nope, nope. Okay, touch operation, I keep it off. On my A6500, I do have it on, but because I have the joystick right here on my Sony A7R3 and A7 III, I don't ever use touch operation, I just use the joystick. Um, HDMI settings, um, right here. Um, if you are using an external monitor or an external recorder and you see the HDMI display on a screen like you're, you are seeing now on my screen, uh, and you don't want that, make sure you turn off HDMI info display. But if you want to record your menu uh, menu setting screens like I am what I'm doing right here, you want to keep that on. So, so yeah, now you know how I record the back of my screen now. Uh, let's see here, next uh, page four of tab five. Oh, okay. So now I'm on page six, setup six of tab five and uh, record media settings. So this allows you to do some interesting things to your two SD card slots. So one, you'll see prioritize record media. It will always, uh, by default, will record to slot one. You can obviously change that to slot two. You always want to shoot to slot two. But what's interesting is um, recording mode, standard. So standard just means um, it will record, it'll finish recording uh, slot one first. If your memory fills up on slot one, it will automatically switch to slot two. And you gotta make sure your auto switch media is turned on for that to work. But you can also do some interesting things. You can have the camera record uh, photo simultaneously to two cards or video simultaneously to two cards, or you can do both photos and video simultaneously to two cards, or you can even sort them out. You can have slot one to only take the raw files and the second, tar second card to only take the JPEGs or vice versa. Or you can even have one SD card strictly records videos and the other SD card to strictly take photos. So a lot of uh, different combinations that you can set for the recording mode. I myself do simultaneous photo and video just because um, for weddings, I like to have a, a backup, a, a second SD card as a backup. So that's what I would personally use for uh, weddings. But for the most part, I keep it on stand. All right, so the last tab is the star tab, which is the My Menus tab. So a lot of people kind of complain about the Sony menu system, how it's really confusing to navigate. So what Sony is doing is like, hey, well, you can make your own menu if you don't like ours. So you can put whatever it is that you like, the, the settings and the, and the features that you like to change very often into its own separate page. So you can customize it to however you like. I personally have Gamma display assist, sound shooting, grid line, and monitor brightness. But again, this is something that I don't often touch too much myself. So everything that I need to have access would already be readily available on my custom button as well as my function. But hey, this could be helpful for somebody out there. Oh my gosh, my hand. Okay, so that is how I set up my Sony a7 III and Sony a7R III for hybrid shooting. I hope you guys learned a lot from this video. I hope this video has been very informative. I'm getting really tired. This setup video is getting way too long. I'll talk to you guys in my next video. Peace.